What is up, guys? It is the Blue Bloods coming back at you. It is our first episode in our Big 12 and 30 days. We just wrapped up Big 10 and 31 days, so shout out to everyone who came on and joined me there. But we are joined by four-time Kansas Sportscaster of the Year, Kansas State's Director of Sportscasting, and, of course, the voice of the Kansas State Wildcats, Wyatt Thompson, is joining us today. And I just want to say I really appreciate you coming on. Well, it's my pleasure to be on with you, Zach. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about something I love, and that's K-State sports, K-State football, too. (laughs) I love it. And yeah, I had to pull out the K-State gear for this one. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't let it sit up in the closet any longer. But let's start with this past season. It the Wildcats finished four and six, but it was a year that could be defined by youth at key positions, injuries, and we had the whole COVID situation. Did this season meet, exceed, or fall short of your preseason expectations? Really good question. And I think probably a little of all of it. I, I think that's probably the answer, though, for almost everybody that dealt with COVID through this past season. You know, I think about, you know, going into the year, they were so excited to have experience at quarterback with Skylar Thompson. And then the next thing you know, he goes out for the entire season um, in the, like the third or fourth game of the year. That was a real bite, to be honest with you. That really, really hurt. I think they had off and on issues with COVID all along. I mean, I I remember a game where I found out the Friday before we played that we weren't going to have our starting corners at Oklahoma. I found out on Saturday morning at Baylor that we weren't going to have a couple of starting offensive linemen. And I think just from a continuity standpoint, Zach, that it was just really hard to get things going. Yes, they were inconsistent, uh, but but I think there were reasons for that up and above and beyond the norm. And at the end of the day, they were, by their own admission, you know, you lose to Arkansas State. Two weeks later, you beat Oklahoma. I think that puts in a, a nutshell what it was like. But late in the year, in all honesty, they were just too short to have an opportunity to, to hang with teams that were really pretty good. As you remember, we played Iowa State very late in Ames, played Texas here mm-hmm. late. And just weren't good enough to compete. And I think that's why this spring they've really, really tried hard to, you know, develop more depth and 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 knock on wood, stay a little bit more healthy as we hopefully get past COVID mo- moving into 2021. Right. And, you know, as we've done, we had ace of everyone from the ACC and Big Ten on the podcast before. That's a big thing is without spring practice, they didn't really get in the strength and conditioning that you would normally see in a normal season. So we've seen that. But you talk about Skylar Thompson's injury. I've been a student here now for three years, and Skylar Thompson is the face of K-State football right now as a player. Will Howard was thrust into the spotlight immediately when that injury happened. How big of a loss was Thompson, and what does he mean to this offense and a program as a whole when he's 100% healthy? It's another good question because I, I think it's hard to put into perspective Skylar's career if you haven't followed it very closely. If you remember, he was also thrown into the mix very early in his career. It might not have been in the third or fourth game of the year, but it was in his freshman season. So he's been an on and off starter basically for four plus years. And so he has a great deal of experience Uh, in in visiting with Skyler. I think there I never really questioned whether he was going to come back or not. I just felt like because of the way he got hurt. And when he got hurt, that he would he would come back. He he loves K State. Uh, he he's like you. When you're here, you get it. You know, it, it's a it's a special place. It means a lot to him, and I I think that still continues to be the case. Once he went down, it goes back to what we talked about a moment ago with with Will Howard. I think it would be most difficult to have a young man that comes in for spring ball and then stays through the summer and then is thrust into the starting position three or four games in. Well, think now about taking away the spring practice and him having to return home and really not having much summer. And then he reports in the fall camp, the first part of August. And then basically a month and a half later, he's playing. That had to have been a most difficult thing. And I know he made his mistakes, but I I profess to you that under those guidelines and circumstances, what he did was really pretty admirable, to be honest with you. I think he would have even been better, though, excuse me, had he been 
a young man who had a, a spring and a summer uh, with those seven on sevens and that he would have been better. So I really think back to the original thought here, I believe with a team that, you know, won four games last year, had Skyler not gotten hurt. I think you could safely say that this team would have won at least, at least seven ball games. At least that would be my opinion. I, I absolutely agree. I, I, I kind of point to that Oklahoma game is like, look at what that team could have been if they were fully healthy, if they don't have COVID injuries. It was a lost year for a lot of people due to COVID, but I feel like K-State was one of those teams. And it, you can put it on the shoulders. I, it, it's hard as it is. You might lose them if you're not looking closely. 5'5", five, five, 170, Deuce Vaughn <laughs> yeah. was the breakout star for K-State last year, and he carried this team through some tough games late in the season. How how was Vaughn so successful as a true freshman, no spring practice, getting to campus with, with COVID and everything? And what do you think his overall potential is at K-State? Well, the difference here between his story, at least from my perspective, and say a, a, a Will Howard, is kind of uniquely different. And let me explain that. It, it's really as simple as this, I think, when you talk about a young man by the name of Deuce Vaughn. Deuce, first and foremost, played very high-level high school football in Texas. That, that's a big deal, okay? Secondarily, his dad has been a coach and a scout for most of Deuce's life. He had the uh, – I've, I've talked to Brian Anderson, the running backs coach at K-State, about this. Because of his ability to scout, Deuce walked in here with his own K-State playbook. He kind of, oh, wow. in, in watching film, had a really, really, really good idea of what K-State football was going to be all about. And so he overcame no spring where it was a little tougher for Will. And certainly in defense of Will, you're playing quarterback as opposed to running right. back too. I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that Deuce is a very unique person, and I thought was probably, I don't want to overstate this, Zach, but I'll give you an idea of what I believe is reality. I think he was probably as college ready as any freshman we've had here, probably since Tyler Lockett. Now, people wow. are going to say, wow, he's going to go on and he'd be a big time pro and all that. That's not what I mean. I'm just saying college ready out of the gate because he played high level ball. He'd been around it. He, but he, on top of that, he understood a lot about K state's offense. So he hit the ground running. And then when you figure into the mix too, and this was a factor, believe it or not, when Joe Urban opted out it and, and in being totally transparent here, Jacardi A. Wright didn't, didn't play very well early. It opened the door and number 22 took big advantage of it. There's no question yeah. about that. Yeah, uh, he was my – he was. I think he was one of my – I think he was my Big 12 breakout player of the year. Yeah. He, I mean, and I think he's probably going to be a top two or three running back in the Big 12. I mean, you got Bajon Robinson at Texas. Yeah. You have, of course, Barisi Hall at Iowa State, who are both amazing athletes. But Deuce Fawn's right there. And I want to shift to the coaching at K-State. We got to talk. I was lucky enough my first year here was Bill Snyder's last year at K-State. So I got to see my first K-State game in his last year. Can you speak to you know our listeners about how Snyder was so successful at K-State and what makes him so beloved in the community of Manhattan? Well, <laughs> probably my favorite question to this point, uh, just, <laughs> just because, <clears throat> pardon me, I, I had – the distinct pleasure of coming in here in 2002 after he had already established himself uh, coming way back in 89 and, and watching him go through what we call here uh, inside the walls of K-State Athletics, see that Bill Snyder 2.0 after the retirement coming back and getting them uh, back to bowl games, uh, a Big 12 championship for a second time. Uh, I think uh, and I've said this to coach, so I'm not saying anything that, that I wouldn't say to anybody else. I think they'll be talking about Bill Snyder at Kansas State and in the Big 12 50 years from now or 100 years from now. Because at the, at the beginning, he took over a program that had no money, no facilities or infrastructure, very little interest. I mean, you could walk into the Manhattan Mall and not find a K-State football t-shirt. Wow. And, then, and then when I came back into the state, in 2002, 
people were wearing K-State underwear and were painting the power cat on silos on farms. And I mean, he, he made it special. And to, to do that, taking over the losingest program in the history of Division One college football, and then at one point winning, what, 10 or more games five years in a row or whatever it was, that's just, I mean, <laughs> go find somewhere else that it's happened. I don't think you can. So no. it was a unique thing to have him come at a time where they literally were contemplating going to Division II in, in football. It's, it's, it's crazy, to be honest. Yeah, it's one of the greatest stories. I mean, I don't think there's a name associated with the university more so than Snyder in K-State. I mean, you look at maybe Bowden in Florida State, but I don't even think that works at this point, maybe saving at Alabama in the future. But, you know, there's a new coach in town, though, Chris Kleiman. He becomes the man to try to continue Snyder's leg. I mean, what he built, he brings in multiple ch – uh, like a championship pedigree for North Dakota State. What was your initial reaction to the hire of Kleiman, and what would you grade his first two seasons thus far? You know, at the, at the beginning when he was hired, uh, I said to Gene Taylor, the athletic director at K-State, congratulations, you got your guy. And he said, thank you. I, I do believe in him. And I said, well, that's what I meant. I, I said, this is a, an athletic director that knew that he was going to probably be criticized for the hire because it was the comfortable guy in a lot of people's eyes and a guy that he knew in a lot of people's eyes. But to his core, he believed that Chris Kleiman could do this because of exactly what you said, the resume he had built at North Dakota State. I don't think you win at that level and not know what you're doing. So now can he translate that from that level of FCS play to Division I Power Five? And a lot of guys have tried it. Few have done well. Many have not. So there was risk involved there. And that's what I meant with Gene in that, you know, this was a guy that he totally, 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 totally believed in. And here we are two years and going into a third year. And it's, it's a little bit tough to judge Chris Kleiman from this point, because when the world was normal, uh, we had a pretty good season, went to a bowl game and lost a Navy. It's hard to judge through COVID. So I, I'm very anxious to see, you know, what we look like this fall with a very difficult schedule. And then a, a year or two out, I guess what I'm saying is I think he's a terrific football coach and I think he's done a lot of good things here, but I don't know that we'll know for another couple of years as he builds this, because, Hey, he, I, here's why I like Chris Kleiman for a lot of reasons. But one thing he said right away is, is this is a program that you have to really work at and build and continue to, to grow. And he feels like that they're just still in the, the beginning stages of that. You know, you look at our football team right now, there, there are spots where we have a lot of good quality football players in depth, and there are a couple that we don't yet. So I think as we go through that, and you've already seen, in honesty, Zach, you know this, being here, they've already recruited better and better each year. And, and that's just getting your, your footing on the ground and, and, and doing it right. And, and I, I believe these, it isn't just Coach Kleiman. I think he and his staff have done a really good job in recruiting too. They absolutely have, and kind of a follow-up. So, I mean, I graduated from Auburn. I'm a diehard Auburn fan, too. Coming from <laughs> SEC country to Big 12 country, I mean, as we just saw with Auburn's head coaching search, it was a cluster, to say the least. I mean, between people flying out, who who was going to hire. But my the people I kind of am connected to at K-State, there were some, like you said, that were disappointed with the hire. I was like, man, this is an A-plus hire if I had to give it a grade. Was this the number one target for Gene Chandler? Because we did hear names like Brent Venables, and yeah. then that kind of seemed unreasonable to me just because of what's going on at Clemson. And then every connection you heard, there were people who were saying it was either Venables or nobody. They weren't going to be happy. Was Chris Kleiman really the number one target behind the scenes? Well, in my opinion, he was. I certainly don't want to speak for Gene Taylor, but I, I think we all felt like right from the beginning that he would be at the very top of the list just because of their – previous relationship. And those kind of things happen. I think Coach right. Kleinman would be the first to tell you that, you know, he, he had some good fortune there. I think he was on his way to being a Division I Power Five coach at some point, or at least a group of five or above coach at some point yeah. anyway. Th this just made the, the path maybe a little bit simpler uh, because of his relationship with Gene. I think there were other guys that 
that they talk to. You know, I, I think I think about, you know, Matt Wells at uh, Texas Tech. I think they had some interest in him. Neil at, at West Virginia is a terrific football coach. And I think I think that he was on the list. So, you know, Chris Kleiman ended up being the guy. But I, I think Gene Taylor did a pretty good job in putting a list together of, you know, four or five or six guys that were, were going to be in the mix that he had interest in. And, and, and it turned out to be a pretty good group. And, you know, I, I, again, I think we'll find out as we go. But I, I'm pretty confident in Chris and, and what he's done to this point. What's happening now behind the scenes that I'm fortunate enough to see every day, I, I really, really like his staff, and they work hard, and I think they, th- you will see them transform and get better and better as we go, I believe. I definitely agree. And you speak about connections. That is 100% something that matters in college football hires. I mean, the AD at Auburn said it was a – it was an AD conference where he met Coach Brian Harson, and that yeah. one meeting is what led him to get an Auburn job. But you talk about recruiting. I, I'm the recruiting guy on this podcast. I love talking recruiting. Sure. A top, a top 60 class for K-State this past year. They did some work in the transfer portal, but they also lost some people. Josh Youngblood is one person I think is a huge loss. But Jake uh, Rubley out of Iowa was the top prospect in the class, top 200 recruit. What were the biggest positional needs for K-State this class, and who do you think could contribute immediately? Well, let's, it's, it's really a good question, too, because I think we could look at a lot of different positions. Because if you, if you look at it, they lost Drew Wiley on the defensive front. They lost two starting linebackers who had basically been here six years. Uh, yeah. they, we weren't sure exactly, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, we didn't know for a certain period of time whether Skyler would come back or not. I guess the easiest answer to your question is, is I think they wanted to go out and strengthen every single position. That was the goal. There may have been an exception or two. And as an example, running back comes to mind because they did return Deuce. They did return Keon Mosey. They did return Jacardi A. Wright. And I think they were pretty confident that Joe Irvin was going to come back. That's a pretty good grouping of four. Uh, they lost some secondary guys, so they needed corner help. Um, w- when you look at the transfer guys, I think they did a great job there because they're probably, in all honesty, going to have a starting corner in this grouping of five, probably potentially a starting safety, uh, a starting defensive tackle, and a starting tight end in, in Daniel Bebe, who I think our fans are really going to appreciate. He's a very, very talented guy. Timmy Horn, a defensive tackle, is really, I think, going to be a guy who's, well, he's in the mix already. And I, I think he could push for starting position. And that says a lot when, when the guys that are back are guys like Jalen Pickle and, 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 and people like that. Um, uh, Eli Huggins is a really good football player here. You know that. So yeah. I think from that perspective, they've done a really good job. But I also look at, you know, some of the younger kids, like the high school players, you mentioned losing Joshua Youngblood. That wasn't easy. And I think there was, you know, some things that went on, they wanted to change the culture a little bit in the off season. And I think there were some kids that, that weren't happy here and that happens and you have to kind of grow and and get through that. Again, he's still pretty early in the process. So there was some of that, but looking at Jake Rubley, you mentioned him. I mean, it's, it's hard to not watch him and get excited because of his ability to spin the football. He can really throw it. And, you know, there's a reason he was, you know, a four-star kind of guy and a top 200 player. I think he will flourish here. He's like all freshmen to a degree. You know, it's been a little bit overwhelming at the start of spring, but now you see him, you know, three weeks later and he looks pretty darn good. He's learned a heck of a lot. So I really think that there's a lot of growth here and you'll see some of these younger players have impact probably a li- again, maybe putting too much pressure on guys, but I don't want to say, you know, we'll have another do spawn, but I think we're going to have, you know, a couple of two or three freshmen that are impactful like we saw a year ago. Right. And kind of building on that, you know, they don't have to be freshmen. They could be people who were just on the depth chart. We saw Deuce Bond last year. We saw Will Howard. Who are some potential guys who we might not know their name yet that you expect to kind of have their breakout seasons this year? Well, on the offense, let's start there. I, I think there are a few candidates, and one of the guys that jumps out off the page at me right away is a receiver by the name of Jalen Travis. He he did not really see any time a year ago, but 
not because he wasn't a good player. I think it was more because he wasn't ready. He has good size, and we need more size and strength at the receiver position. He's 6'2 and a half, 6'3. Really, uh, really a talented young guy. Uh, Keenan Garber, who is a redshirt freshman, is another guy that I think has really been solid in the receiving core this spring. And there are a couple of guys that, you know, spread around the offense that uh, I, I think people will see uh, this fall. Uh, I, I think one guy that, that probably comes to mind is they, they have a fullback. Let me, let me grab my sh- chart because I don't want to leave anybody out. But uh, I, I, ben, ben Sennett is a guy at the, at the fullback position. He's probably gone from about 210 to about 235 from the end of last wow. year to now. And I'm telling you, the dude can play. He can catch the ball. He's a really good blocker. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at this list. And there, I mean, I could go on all day about it. But those are a handful of guys that, that Connor Fox is another guy uh, who, who's been in the program who hasn't really been impactful yet, but he will now this fall. You watch. So, so those are some of the guys I would, I would mention on the offensive side. And just looking at my chart on the defensive side, uh, some of these guys you probably know a little bit about. Some of them you don't. T.J. Smith, who is a safety, who came in last year and was really making his way and then unfortunately towards ACL, he'll, he'll be ready to go in the fall. And I think he's a dynamic type player. Um, I mentioned Rush East as a transfer and uh, and uh, Julius Brents as a transfer. Those guys will really do good work. But I'm also excited about a guy like Devontae Pritchard. Who, and I don't know if he'll be overly impactful this year, but down the road in that linebacking core, I, I think he'll be a fine player. So uh, I guess if I had to throw out some I, – I know you know these names. Some listening and watching may not. Felix Anudike a defensive end is going to be a terrific player here. And Nate Matlack, who, who had a little less opportunity than Felix last year will be a guy. I can't wait to see what they look like between the day where you and I are talking and the first part of August when they report back for fall camp, because they'll put on more weight and more strength. And that is only going to help those guys hit the field this fall. Right. And, you know, they're going to have some a nice opportunity week one to really break out. There's a huge game against Stanford in Dallas, but they also still have those road trips to Stillwater and Austin this year, which are always difficult to go down to either one of those stadiums. And, of course, the big matchup with Oklahoma. But as someone who's been here, K-State seems to have Oklahoma's number these past <laughs> few years. But the, the, the Sooners are going to be tough this year. But what do you personally think right now is the ceiling and or floor for the 2021 Wildcats? Well, the floor is probably the easiest thing to, to look at because I, I think you're looking at a team that can get back to bowl eligibility. I guess I would say that would be the simplest answer. And I believe that because even though the schedule is difficult, they have two of their three non-conference games at home and they have the, this year is the year in the conference where they have the five, four split with five home games and four on the road. And one of those road games is in Lawrence and no disrespect. I don't mean that as bad as some might take it, but that's an (laughs) advantage to have, have that schedule to be blunt about it. So I think that's the floor of the bottom. Now what's the ceiling at the top. I would hate to put a whole heck of a lot of, um, expectations on it. And here's why. I, I think if you really honestly study the way this thing starts for K-State, it's tough. It's, it's a front-loaded conference schedule where they go to Stillwater and then they have a week off, if I'm not mistaken, and then have Oklahoma. I mean, their, their first three games are really, really hard. But can they win seven, eight, nine games. I think, I think it's, it's possible. Um, but you got, you know, going into last year, I wouldn't have thought that sky was going to miss that much time. Uh, COVID or not, you know, you just don't think that way. So you knock on wood, you have to stay healthy too. You have to have good or better depth than we had a year ago. And I think we're working our way towards that, Zach, to be honest. 
Right. I, I think I think like you said, eight wins is doable for the schedule looking at it. I mean, you said no disrespect. I mean, Kansas Kansas situation is so unique in terms of what's going on with the head coach search, the A D search. There's a lot going on over in Lawrence. And then you also have Iowa State returning. I think they're returning like twenty starters or something crazy like that. And yeah, Spencer Rattler's on the upswing, but you know, for our listeners, these last two questions are two of my favorite to ask people. And I know this the answer to this one because now I'm a student here and I've experienced it. But for those who don't know, what makes Manhattan Bill Snyder Family Stadium so such a unique environment on game days? Well, that's an easy one for me because at the end of the day, and this will sound cliche-ish and a lot of people talk about this, but it's the fan base. I, I can't tell you how many hundreds of people have have said to me through this pandemic i can't wait till this is over so i can come back not just to the games but to tailgate and and just absorb you know the game <clears throat> excuse me the game day experience i think there are a lot of fans in our fan base as an example that plan their vacation around the bowl season i don't know that it's like that everywhere and th- this is a a small enough town that is very conducive to being around and seeing the athletes kind of feeling like you own a little bit of it. You know what I'm saying? Like you're a a piece and a part of it. Uh, And I think that's true in Ames. I think that's true in Stillwater to me that um, that's part of what makes the big 12 really cool because you see that in a lot of different places. I've said, for many, many years, and I'll start my 20th year in, in July, which makes me old and feel old, uh, <laughs> but, but I, I've had a ball doing it. But I, at the end of the day, the fans and their passion towards this university, not just football, but towards the school and towards the athletics side of it, is, uh, it it's pretty special, man. It's really, you know, you, you're here, so yeah. you, you know what I'm, I'm saying. It, it's, it's really pretty neat. Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, I love going to the K-State basketball games. I, <laughs> sure. I love going to the football games. I mean, it's all there. And, you know, last question here, you mentioned it. You've been the voice of the Wildcats since 2002. You've seen amazing games, players, moments, coaches. What has been the most memorable moment and or game that you have called for K-State football in your career? Whew. You know, I get asked that one a lot, and I, I think it's <laughs> probably pretty simple, really. And it kind of ties back into Coach Snyder there that we talked about a moment ago. I, for me, beating the Oklahoma team in the Big 12 championship game in 2003 will always be probably the, the, the high ceiling for me, or at least I think it will be. And it was because a, a, a great moment for me, but it was for me personally, it was more about Coach Snyder finally did it. After all of that grinding from first visiting campus in 88 and then coming in 89 and, you know, going one and 10 that first year and and then starting that long, long run of bowl games in 93 to come so close in 98 and lose in overtime to A&M to finally get to the pinnacle of that. I just remember driving away from Arrowhead that night thinking what it must be like uh, to be Bill Snyder at this moment <laughs> because of what he had done uh, here, because I, I'm not overstating this in any way. He had done the impossible in the eyes of many, in, including mine. Uh, and, and for that, I think that will always be number one. I'll, I'll never forget it. Um, if I die tomorrow or I live to be a hundred, that will, that will probably be it to be honest. Uh, I completely agree. I mean, I don't think people understand that uh, K-State was one of the losingest programs of all time yeah. when Bill Snyder got there. And-, and, you, and you know this too, Zach, I have to throw this in. People forget sometimes that going into that championship game, there were many pundits saying that that Oklahoma team might have been as good as any college football team ever. And K-State mm-hmm. won that night 35-7. to So that – I look back on that group now and I think more than just coach Snyder, but the, I mean, all five of those guys on the offensive line had at least a cup of coffee in the league. Darren Sproles was a brilliant talent, you know, mm-hmm. L Robers. I mean, it just goes, I mean, when I first got here, you know, you, Terrence Newman wasn't a part of the O three team, but he was in O two. There's so many, Josh Buell and Brian Hickman and 
I could go on and on and on, but that was a <laughs> superb football team, no doubt about it. It absolutely was, but man, I am so excited for the season. I'm excited to be here at K-State, but <laughs> where can our listeners find any of the broadcasts, your social media, any, any shows you do? Where can our listeners find you? Well, we do have a 30-station sports network. Uh, it's K-State Sports Network from Learfield IMG College, and if they go to our website at kstatesports.com, they'll find a list of all of those affiliates. I'm not the world's biggest uh, when it comes to tweeting. As a matter of fact, I, I'm on Twitter <laughs> but I'm probably the worst at tweeting out things. Uh, <laughs> but I do, I do love following all the people that follow the Big 12 there. You can tweet me, though, if, if you'd like to do that. I'm at, at Cat Voice Wyatt. Um, and so that's probably the biggest. If, if, not, if nothing else, just look me up on, on the web and give me a shout. I'd love to talk to people. I, I, this is what I do for a living, so it's just kind of part of it. Absolutely. Guys, make sure to catch some K-State games this year. It's a promising time out here in the little apple, but I appreciate you coming on, man. We'll definitely be reaching out closer to the season. Hope, hopefully we'll get some, you know, primetime K-State games. I'm sure that Iowa State and Oklahoma game is going to be <laughs> one to remember, to, to say the least. But guys, for myself, for Wyatt, and the Blue Bloods, we are out.